I'm preaching a message that has just been so, so beautifully weighty in my life. You can ask my family. It's kind of just been the thing that I've come back to over the last few months. And it started on a quiet morning in the Bible, in the Word, and it just jumped out at me. It's a fresh revelation for us. I believe a culture-setting revelation for us as a church. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Carolina. My husband, and Jared, and I lead the church here. And, um, and I just love this, when the Lord brings fresh manner to us and moves us in the direction He wants us to go. And so, you know, I just want to, I guess, paint a picture You know, when I first became a Christian, I was so surprised that God loved me. I was actually so humbled by his acceptance of me. I don't know if there's anyone else like that in the room. I definitely didn't ride into town like the Queen of Sheba. I definitely came into the presence of God crawling. And I was so amazed that he loved me. I was so amazed that he desired me, that he would pursue me. I was so amazed that he had plans and purposes for me. I was amazed that he thought I was worth his life. I was amazed that he thought then that I had something to offer. I was amazed that the Lord would look on me and invite me to share in what he was doing in the earth. I don't know if there's anyone else who feels that at the feet of their king. It was like, me, God? Are you sure? I remember becoming a Christian and being surprised that he would trust me with anything. That he would actually go, here you are, and trust me with the precious things of the kingdom. That he would put anything in my hand. And and release me to steward that thing. I was so surprised that my past didn't disqualify me. I was so surprised that my lack of knowledge didn't hold me back. I was so glad that even though there are people in the church who knew more than me, that seemed to not matter to God. That my lack of understanding and the shallowness of my faith at that stage was irrespective to him. I was so surprised that he wasn't mad at me, that he wasn't disappointed in me. I was so surprised that he wanted to include me. And all these emotions, all these revelations brought me to a place that made that scripture so true, we love because he loved first. And so, of course, my response is is one of awe. In the book of Acts, we see the Lord confront Peter, who had some religious mindsets when it came to people who were outside the Jewish community. And the Lord has to, I mean, Peter does things in threes. Some of us are a little bit slower than others. And so if you look at Peter's life, the Lord has to bring home a message three times every time. And so in the book of Acts, he's trying to teach Peter not to be prejudiced. And so he has this Um, dream actually, a vision. And at the end of it, he says this in Acts 10, Peter says, truly now I understand that God shows no partiality towards people. No partiality, but anyone in any nation who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to the Lord. Anyone. And so the Lord had to get this right in Peter's life so that Peter could minister to what were called the Gentiles or the people outside the Jewish community, because that was me. I was someone who wasn't pedigree. I was someone who was on the outside, and I was surprised that the Lord would bring me in, and I was so glad that it wasn't dependent on my pedigree. And you know, there are two ends of the spectrum in, and everything in between, even in this room. There are people who have generational heritage in the Lord. And then there's probably someone here, you've walked in for the first time and you've been debating whether to come because you've been afraid that the roof might fall in on you if you walked into the building. (laughs) Two ends of the spectrum. Actually, with Jared and myself, you'll get the two ends of the spectrum. 
beautiful heritage, lineage of generations of preachers and pastors and missionaries. And a girl whose grandparents were all orphaned in the war with a commun- you know, fear of communism and everyone's out to get you, the height of dysfunction and brokenness. And that's what we have in Jesus because Jesus was both a king and the son of an unwed teenage girl. There's no one that he doesn't relate to. And so I was so surprised that he would include me. And as this grew more in my heart, I became really suspicious, this growing feeling that God was always up to something and that he actually wanted to share the fun with us. And the suspicion in me started to grow as I started to respond to his invitation. Hey, come and watch this. Join arms with me and get in on what I'm doing. I'm like, me? You sure? Okay. And so as I started to come alongside God, I realized I didn't have to be the smartest person in the room. I didn't have to have a heritage in the Lord. I didn't have to be squeaky clean in my past. I just needed to be close. That was it. Close enough to hear his invitation. Close enough to roll up my sleeves when he said, let's do this. Close enough to say, yeah, I'm right with you. That was it. I just needed to be close. I just needed to be willing. I just needed to be obedient. I just needed to be available. I just needed to be ready. You know, the Lord wants to bring us in to what he's doing. He wants to share secrets with his people, but he'll only share it with the ones who are close. He'll only share it with the ones who are watching and listening with an apron on and a towel in hand. I could be and I can be a participator with God. I can experience firsthand what he's doing. I can be one of the instigators alongside him when he does a move. That's up to me. I can be that. It's open. We get to do this. And some of the most beautiful miracles, some of the beautiful moments are in the unseen because I want to let you know, not everyone gets in on this. Would you turn with me to John 2? And this is where it came alive to me. John 2, the wedding at Cana. This is Jesus' first ever miracle. He's picked his disciples and he's at a wedding. And so John chapter 2, we read this. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there also. Jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her what no son should ever say, woman, what does this have to do with me? If you have sons, you will be familiar with that response. And then his mother did what every good mother does, ignores the response and carries on. She says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jars, water jars, for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. That's about a bathtub. So six stone stone jars with the capacity of a bathtub's worth of water each. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, it had now become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. When the people have drunk freely, then they serve the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This was the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifest his glory, and his disciples believed in him. 
There was an MC, a master of the feasts. He was oblivious to the fact that he was in the presence of a miracle. There was a crowd at the wedding. They were oblivious to the fact they were in the middle of a miracle. They were all benefactors of the miracle, but unaware, unimpacted, unchanged. But who knew? The disciples and the servants. And there are so many MCs in life, isn't there? Especially now where everyone's an expert and a keyboard warrior. Everyone knows, everyone knows everything about everything. There are also crowds everywhere we go. But do you know what? There's crowds and then there's team. There's crowds and then there's disciples. And often the multitude has no idea what is happening. There's a small selected few who do. And being behind the scenes is where the change happens, where the revelation happens, and when we get the inside knowledge. And today, I want to encourage us that I want to be the person who carries the water so that I can pour the wine. Only the ones who carry the water will pour the wine. Only the ones who carry the water will pour the wine. You don't get the privilege of pouring the wine unless you carry the water. It was the same we heard at INC 50 conference, Elisha. Elijah met Elisha in a field and he was plowing 12 yoke of oxen. It was the family business. Usually it's one yoke of oxen. This guy's plowing 12 yoke of oxen and he's been doing it his whole life this monotonous job because it was the family business and Elijah met him there and through the mantle, the miraculous power, the anointing, the presence of God on Elisha as he was plowing the field. I want to tell you, you don't get the mantle unless you push the plow. You don't pour the wine unless you carry the water. We all want the mantle. We all want the wine, but I want to tell you the greatest reward is reserved for those who pay the highest price. It's a privilege. We get to do this. The Lord is inviting us into miraculous spaces with him. We have to be close. We have to be ready. We have to be willing. We have to be listening. We have to be ready to roll up our sleeves and say, I'm in God. And he's like, come, come and get in on this with me. Come and get in on what I'm doing in your generation. Come and get in on what I'm doing in your region. Come and get in on what I'm doing all around you. Do you see it? Do you perceive it? Are you close enough to hear my spirit? We get to do this. And so I choose to carry the water so that I can pour the wine, so that I can see the miraculous. Because carrying the, mon- the, the water is often mundane, which is why most people don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they don't want to do it. But the Lord's asking, what's in your hand? What is in your hand, Moses? Just a staff? Great. Use that. Every miracle you do will be using that staff. What's in your hand, Rebecca? Just a water jug and a well. Awesome. Use that and become the princess of Israel. What's in your hand, JL? Just a tent peg? Awesome, use that and bring about a military victory for your whole nation. What's in your hand, Elijah? Uh, A cloak. Great, use that to strike the water and conduct miracles. What's in your hand, widow? All I've got is one bit of flour and one bit of oil. Awesome, use that, give it away and make sure your wine, your, your oil and flour never run out. What's, what have you got, Mary? My virginity? Awesome. Let's bring about the savior of the world. What about you, little boy? Oh, just some loaves and fish? Great. Let's feed 5,000 people. It's the small, insignificant, daily things that the Lord is asking, are you in this with me? 
are you in this wholeheartedly with me? Do you have integrity around that thing? Do you have a heightened sense of character around that thing? Do you have a heightened sense of expectation around that thing? That monotonous everyday thing and then when the Lord turns up and it suddenly is no longer an everyday monotonous thing. Suddenly that day it's miraculous. It might seem tedious until it's suddenly not. And just being present in the here and now is the breeding ground for miracles. So I choose to carry the water so that I can pour the wine. Just this month, Amanda Jensen opened her home one Monday night to a bunch of young mums. And we sat there together, laughed, told stories. And that that night, one of the mums unexpectedly burst into tears and we were able to all catch her. Was just opening her home. A beautiful lady in our church named Sandra sent $500 to a family in India whose daughter is chronically ill and bought them a fridge. Just last week, a lady named Rose walked into the foyer midweek, spinning internally, domestic violence situation. She received Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our foyer in the middle of the day on a Wednesday. Michael and Clem run their men's group on a Thursday morning. Heath comes and plays keys and worships for a few hours once a week in the morning. When no one else, when you're not here, Heath's here. The Love Army carried out their last job for the year. Simon and Ash met a bunch of kids in the car park at McDonald's and witnessed to them. They came across and all got saved that night. One of them emptied 11 vapes out of his bag that night. Maya fortnightly stays right through with the up and coming worshippers of our church to train them in worship and the instrument. Amanda Vanderboon stays back some Sundays and fills our freezer with home cooked meals that we can send out into the community. That family in India got together and prayed and thanked Jesus for the provision. Because in scripture, wine represents joy. The greatest joy you and I will ever have is in giving ourselves away. That's where happiness is. You'll never keep yourself happy by trying to keep yourself happy ever. It's insatiable. Hang on to your life and you'll lose it. Give your life away and you will find it. In Hebrews, talking about Jesus in chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I just want to assure you there's nothing joyful about hanging on a cross till death. It wasn't that. What was the joy? It was me, you. For the joy set before him, he endured. For the joy set before us, we pour ourselves out. Because wine represents joy. Wine represents joy. Just this week, everything's ramping up for Christmas. And I was just chatting with Shekinah, who's doing the most beautiful job leading two locations into Christmas shows this year. And she's telling me that it's getting to the pointy end of things. And just this week, had a few things to troubleshoot. And she said, you know what? We get to this point every year, and I just say, Lord, it has to be you. Because this is bigger than any one person's capacity. And you know, the beautiful thing is, for the joy set before her, she's enduring. Do you know every other show is being cancelled because of the rain? I wonder where they're all going to turn up in a couple of weeks' time. For the joy set before us. 
And she said to me, the beautiful thing is year after year we do, we get to a point where we go, it could only have been God. I do my bit, I carry the water, but I get to pour the wine. I get to stand back and watch the hands go in the air, responding to, and know I carried some of that water. And now I get to pour the wine. I get to walk alongside in the years to come those salvations who become disciples because I carried water. Because I did the mundane thing. Wesley Jewell wrote a phenomenal book called A Blaze for God. I encourage you to read it. In the book, towards the second half, he describes a person of God. And he says this term, person of God, is something we throw away way too easily right now. That it's something, a title and a description that shouldn't be given lightly. But he defines a person of God. He says a person of God is marked by a consistently righteous and holy life. We're talking about carrying water. Consistently righteous and holy life. A person of God manifests the fruits of the Spirit. A person of God is filled with the Spirit. A person of God lives a life of love and a life of service. A person of God pays the cost. What is that cost? They're saturated in the Word. They are given to prayer. They train themselves in kingdom principles, and they have a supreme commitment. Church, can I encourage you? A casual commitment will never be sufficient. Not if you want to be one of the ones who pours the wine. A life of service and love and consecration requires that I desire the Lord and his presence and his kingdom as the supreme desire of my life. Before and above anything else, that I desire his presence, his kingdom, his presence as supreme in my life. This life of service and love and consecration requires that I set myself apart from cultural norms. What's okay for everyone is not okay for the ones who want to pour the wine. It requires a consecration, a setting apart. Paul said to Timothy, flee those things. Flee those things, but pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. If I want to be a person who pours the wine, If I want to be a person who gets the mantle, then I need to be a person who pays the price. I need to be a person who consecrates myself. That I need to be extravagant and lavish in giving myself away. There need to be no backdoor options in my walk with Jesus. There is no plan B. Jesus is everything or he's nothing. There's no option. I need to be shameless in my devotion and my expression of my discipleship. That there would be no doubt. That there would be no question. I need to be shameless about it. That my one and only goal is to please Jesus. That I have a Jesus first attitude. A Jesus only attitude. And so I choose to carry the water so I can pour the wine. I need to be completely inflexible in my pursuit of Jesus. Love always serves. In Galatians, Paul writes to the church, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but use your freedom to love and serve one another. No one is too good to serve, and no one ever graduates from serving. I can't serve my way out of serving. It is the highest call of the kingdom. 
Do you know, on his last day, Jesus put on a towel and washed feet. He knew it was his last day. I wonder what I would do on my last day. He chose to serve. In Philippians, the church in Philippi receive a letter and it tells them that Jesus emptied himself of his godness and he took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. I want to tell you there's nothing impossible for God through a consecrated life. Fully consecrated. When I'm fully consecrated, I am a conduit. I am a vessel. I'm a portal. When I'm fully consecrated to the Lord, there's nothing he can't do through me. Nothing. In 1903, a man named Watchman Nee was born in China. At that point, provincial China, so it wasn't illegal to be a Christian. He came to Christ at the age of 17. And at the age of 17, he immediately started sharing his faith and preaching around China. The emphasis of his life was prayer and Holy Spirit. He said this, I don't consecrate myself to be a missionary or a preacher. I consecrate myself to God to do his will, be it in the school, the office, or the kitchen, or wherever he may, in his wisdom, send me. In the 1930s, he began starting churches in homes, declaring that the local church is the living body of Christ. And so he started these small home churches throughout China. In a few short years, there were 700 churches accounting for 70,000 people. He called these house churches the little flock. And then in 1949, the rise of communism outlawed Christianity, which forced the church underground. But guess what? There were already 700 churches in homes. Did Watchman Nee know communism was coming? No. He was just a life consecrated to the Lord. And the genius of heaven used him as a conduit to circumvent what the enemy was bringing into that country. He had no idea. And so the church continued to flourish in communism. In 1952, because he kept preaching anyway, Nee was arrested for spreading the gospel and given a 15-year sentence. He was scheduled for release in 1967, but he was required to renounce his faith as a condition of his release. When he refused... They sent him to a cruel labor camp. He died five years later at the age of 71 in 1972. This note was found next to his bed. Christ is the Son of God, who dies for the redemption of sinners, who was resurrected after three days. This is the greatest truth of the universe. I die because of my belief in Christ. How many of us are too afraid to share, to serve? How many of us can today stand and say, you know what, Lord, I choose to carry the water so that I can pour the wine? How many of us want to say, God, whatever it takes, use my life. Lord, I consecrate myself today to be a person who isn't looking for comfort, to be a person who isn't looking for convenience, to be a person who doesn't want to be one of the crowd, to be a person who wants to be on the inside, right alongside you as you do great things. Because those who love the Lord and devote themselves will do great exploits. There is nothing impossible for God through a consecrated life. In every setting, like Watchman Nee said, whether it's the school 
or the kitchen or the office or wherever it is. We are consecrated to the Lord by His great wisdom to do what He wants to do in those settings. So this morning, if we could all bow our heads and close our eyes. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning and you're part of the crowd. You're not a disciple, but you want to get in on what the Lord's doing. You're hearing His invitation this morning. And maybe you're like me and you're a little bit surprised to even be here. You're a little bit like, is this really even for me? I want to tell you, yes, absolutely it is. There's nothing that excludes you from His love. There's nothing that excludes you from this invitation today to come and be a follower of Jesus, to come close. And if that's you today and you are not close, but you want to come close, I'd love for you just to raise your hand as I look around. No one else looking. Thank you. I see your hand. You want to come close to the Lord. Is there anyone else as I look across the room this morning? I want to join that one. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, Jesus, we thank you today for your invitation. Father, we thank you, God, that you bring us close, that your love covers all sins, all failures, all mistakes. Father, today we acknowledge those sins, those failures, those mistakes. And we say, Lord, we are sorry. We place them before you today as an act of surrender and an act of repentance. And we take on our true identity in you as sons and daughters of God. And we thank you for the opportunity to be able to do that. Lord God, I pray now for that great forgiveness of sins, that you wash us white as snow. You make us new, that the old has gone and the new has come. Father, I saw a hand you saw a heart, and there may have been many more, Lord, responding this morning. You see the heart, the condition of the heart. Father God, I pray that you would just come in. Lord, I pray that you'd come around. I pray that you'd surround us by your great divine love, an ocean of love today. Father, the cleansing and the forgiveness of sin this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your family, to sit with you, to work with you, the unforced rhythms of grace, that today would just be the beginning of a lifelong journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us online. We pray you are blessed by today's message. If you want prayer for anything, you want to connect with us, or you made a commitment to Jesus today, we'd love to take this from a digital to a personal relationship. So reach out via the link in the description below. Be blessed. We'll see you soon.